All right, so welcome everyone, as uh, Alan was very kind to introduce <laughs> uh, myself, Bruce, uh, I'll just get to it then. So we'll start off with, a, uh, with an outline. I'll just give a quick uh, introduction of myself, about 30 to 40 minutes there. And then uh, I'll just, uh, we'll take a, a different, a look at different kinds of astrophotography and equipment used, but this, uh, presentation will be mostly on deep sky uh, imaging. I do planetary as well. Maybe we can do that another time. Uh, that's a whole Great. different other field, yeah. And then we'll look at the uh, difference between a uh, small telescope and large telescopes. And then I underline this one, which is uh, very important, which is the challenges of deep sky imaging. So we'll just take a look at the different, uh, the aspects of dealing with you know, different um, yeah, challenges basically. And then uh, the cu current uh, camera technology and the camera that I'm using now. And then we have some examples of broadband imaging, uh, narrowband imaging, and then questions at the end. So hope not to bore you too long. Yeah, so uh, I started with uh, black and white uh, photography back in the late 90s. Uh, it had its charm, you know, with the dark room and the, the chemicals and everything. Uh, and then uh, I was, uh, I was at the time, or after that, I was uh, working on these offshore installations on rigs um, in the middle of nowhere. And then after that, I was working at hydroponic greenhouses and farms, which was also in the middle of nowhere. So these two jobs kind of put me, uh, you know, under the vastness of the sky. And I kind of appreciated more than, uh, you know, someone would be living in the city. And then here's, a, here's a, my first telescope that I bought. This was in 2003. Uh, had no idea what I'm doing, what I was doing at the time. Uh, dozens of telescopes later, I still didn't really know what I was doing, but <laughs> it was fun. Uh, just buying new toys. Yeah, so this was, this, this was 10 years worth of progress here I put in one slide. This was the first deep sky picture I took, I remember, for the DSLR. I was very excited. This was in the early 2000s. And then that really got me hooked. Uh, 10 years on, I took uh, this one here, which was a narrow band uh, image of Orion, but was, I was proud of this picture because this was made, uh, taken with my own telescope. So I actually made an astrograph. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Robert Royce, uh, he's uh, retired now, but he made a very nice, made very nice optics and mirrors and he uh, sent one out to me. Uh, 10 inch and then I, I got carbon fiber fabric and I made a mold and uh, at the time it was uh, FLI CCDs back then which is similar to the one uh, that we have here at SFU. Uh, so yeah it took 10 years to get from this step this stage this stage. My, my point was this slide that you have to be patient and it's not something you can you know within three months of astrophotography you know some people they may be demotivated I think yeah, it's uh, kind of you have to be in it for the long run. Uh, currently, it's mostly deep sky imaging that I'm doing now. Um, I do write some articles and guides and reviews. Uh, I do consulting and training for those who want to get into it. Um, if they want, you know, for institutions as well, if they want to set up uh, stuff. We have an exciting project which I've been working on since last year, which is a NASA uh, Next Dome project. Uh, this was actually with me, this telescope. Um, the entire summer last year. Basically, they wanted a NASA wants uh, for the Florida Space Center. They want a telescope that uh, can do high resolution planetary imaging. Uh, they want live views of the sun with a long focal length of solar imager and uh, live uh, deep sky um, wide field uh, uh, imaging with a fast telescope. So kind of to put everything together in one package. I'm hoping this should be installed there in the next few months. So. We may have some updates on that. So that's an exciting project as well. And so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so I'll just start off with the different kinds of uh, photography. Uh, the basic uh, imaging setup, which will be something uh, wide field panoramic. Uh, a lot of people may start this way. It's very, very easy to get in, very low cost. Basically, it's a DSLR camera. You can, mod you can get some of the cameras that are modified for deep sky lenses, you know, in the 10 to 50 millimeter range, very light. You don't really need a tracking uh, mount or tripod. I do have one here. So these are called sky trackers. Um, 
you're better off being at a dark site because the glow of light pollution will really ruin these images, but there are filters uh, for these. So expect, you know, people ask me, oh, I really want to get into photography. This is the entry point. Uh, about $1,000, you can get started with something, you know, just to wet your feet, they say. Okay, and then we have planetary imaging. Planetary imaging is the, the opposite. Planetary imaging requires, usually requires big telescopes. Uh, the bigger, the better. Uh, most amateurs, they go up to the 16 inch uh, range. This is me with my uh, copy of the Hubble telescope, as you can see. Uh, it's a 14 inch telescope, but I did modify it slightly uh, to optimize it for uh, planetary imaging. So with planetary imaging, actually, people don't, so people usually think, oh, the planets are close, they're bright. It's, uh, you know, I can actually, it's the opposite of what, what you would normally think. With planets, you actually need a lot of uh, magnification and you need a lot of aperture, uh, which is not always the case with deep sky. Uh, a nice thing about planetary is, it is not affected by light pollution. In fact, I remember sometimes, you know, the sun would be up almost, you know, it was kind of, it was the beginning of the morning and I could still uh, shoot the planets because you're shooting a, a very long focal length and very, very short uh, exposures. The exposures are in the milliseconds, five to 10 to 20 milliseconds. Uh, so basically we're shooting hundreds of frames per second. It's a movie. Luckily the cameras are very, very inexpensive. It's, it's $300 for a camera. Um, the entire setup, you could get started with a small setup for about $2,000 to about 10,000 plus for, I mean, this is one of the best ones that you can get and it's not really all that expensive. So planetary, but my point here was you kind of have to decide from the beginning what you're interested in. If you're interested in planets, you're better off going for a planetary setup because they're not really, you know, it's like rally versus formula one. You can't say, oh, I want to do both. You have to pick your gear or your, uh, you know, your race car and design for that specific task. So I'll show you uh, some examples of uh, the best of the best uh, that, that I was able to get. However, I must warn you, uh, you see a lot of these pictures um, and you, you know, in, on websites and magazines and, you know, and marketing all of these pictures taken with these telescopes. Honestly, it's not something you, you can achieve. The average person can achieve. I'm not just saying that because I'm, just to say it was a big achievement, but people usually their expectations are not really met and that's demotivating. And then that kind of, you know, it does basically demotivate them. So uh, you have to be realistic. And this is after a lot of years of, of work, uh, you get to uh, get very, so um, what, what's known as high resolution planetary energy. So these are two examples um, of Saturn and uh, Jupiter taken from a backyard and you can see you know very so the, if you if you take a look at the resolution here you can see where we're talking about sub 0.1 arc seconds per pixel which is over 10 times what uh, uh, typical deep sky high resolution deep sky images are and you need that kind of very high resolution because the planets as I said they're tiny but you can see some very interesting details like you can see the uh, the, the hexagonal storm here, the, the pole of, of Saturn, for example, you can see inside uh, Jupiter's um, great red spot, uh, you know, details inside, there's Clyde's spot here. I mean, this, these kind of images, you know, professional ground-based observatories couldn't take maybe two decades ago. It's just recently, you know, because of the, the improvements in technology and computing software and computing power which allows uh, us amateurs basically stuff off the internet we can get this kind of detail and then uh, so that's it for planetary really i think the rest of the thing the rest of the presentation will uh, just just focus on deep sky uh, which is yeah my current passion uh, so deep sky i wanted to show this setup and that's not you don't necessarily have to go for a very large uh, telescope so something like this, uh, these are called short focal length uh, deep sky image, uh, imaging you know, systems or rigs. They're portable, they're light. Uh, just ignore this big tripod that I made. It's not really necessary. You can get a very small light one. Um, typically we use refracting telescopes. So these are the ones with lenses and it's always best to use a triplet design. So that's one thing I always tell people. 
If you see the word doublet or acromat, do not buy that for imaging because you won't, you'll be disappointed. A triplet is, is, is the way forward, really. especially with nowadays you have very reasonably priced uh, and very good performing, performing uh, triplets. They're usually in the two to four inch range. You can get a nice uh, setup, uh, 300 to 700 millimeters of focal length. So think of it as a big telescope um, camera lens, and that's all you need, really. Um, small to medium tracking mounts. Nowadays, when I started a uh, CCD, a monochrome camera and filter, we probably would cost something in the range of about $10,000. Nowadays, you buy these uh, CMOS uh, imaging cameras for $1,000 and they're, they're pretty decent. They're not the, the best that you can buy right now, but uh, it's very, very easy now to get into astrophotography. Uh, with a you know three to four thousand dollars, you can get started with a nice uh, nice rig. And then uh, there is also the next size up, which is uh, these are the long focal length uh, imaging systems. I find these more uh, challenging, more interesting. Uh, this these would be more suitable for intermediate to advanced uh, um, imagers here. Typically, because of this size, we can't really use uh, refracting or lens type telescopes. So we have to go to mirrors. And whenever you go to mirrors, then there are other issues uh, uh, like collimation, which is basically the alignment of these uh, mirrors, which I'll, I'll touch on in the next few slides. So these uh, amateurs basically, you know, from the 10 to 16 inch range uh, with a thousand to 3000 millimeters of focal length. So you can see that the focal length is now uh, uh, decent. It's respectable. It's uh, it's not really comparable to a camera lens anymore. And once once you get these long focal lengths, then the tracking of your mount becomes very critical. So um, this is one like this mount is is a pretty good mount, a decent mount. Uh, you would need the the mount actually sometimes is considered more important than your actual telescope when you go to these long focal lengths. So that's one thing to watch out for. You can't really um, have a nice big telescope on a small or inaccurate mount. Uh, most uh, advanced amateurs now use monochrome uh, cameras. So these are black and white, and then we'll see how we get uh, color images from black and white sensors. Expect uh, entry cost at least you know, $10,000 $10, and up. So be realistic and uh, yeah, just this is, I wouldn't recommend some these kind of uh, systems for, uh, for a beginner. Maybe uh, after a few years of of, of uh, practice. So, question I get asked mostly by my wife: What's the difference? Why do you need another telescope? <laughs> you already have one. Why do you need another one? So here, for example, um, two telescopes on the same mount. Uh, the one on the left is a small refracting telescope, and the one on the right is a bigger uh, reflecting or mirror type telescope. Uh, here's a fun fact. So the bigger the object in the sky, the smaller the telescope you need. So just uh, it doesn't mean that if you have a small telescope, uh, you won't be able to get uh, objects, you won't be able to get images. Some objects actually require a small telescope. And uh, we'll have a look. Uh, we'll have a look. I'll show you some examples. Here's one, for example. Uh, this was taken with that small little telescope. It's a three inch telescope, almost fits in your pocket. Uh, this was from our backyard here in, in Vancouver. Uh, narrow band image, which I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you the, the difference between what narrow band images and regular imaging. But so this is the the Heart Nebula, and you can see that fish head nebula that we saw on the cover of that magazine, uh, Sky News magazine. It's this part, and then you have the entire heart here, and then you have the core of the heart, which I really want you to take a look at. I want you to focus on this part. And then this same target I took with the, from this, with the same camera, the same filters from the same backyard uh, with the large telescope. This exercise was actually to prove to my wife <laughs> why I need a larger uh, a telescope. So if we look at this core here, we can then zoom in with the large telescope and you can see a big difference uh, in detail and resolution. Basically you're kind of, you could say zooming in and you do see a lot more detail with a large telescope. Obviously, your, your field of view is much narrower. You're, it's, a, it's a smaller portion of the sky. But I'll just flip back. 
Um, and you can see there's a very big difference at this part here uh, versus the core here. So this is longer focal length or higher resolution uh, imaging, that's an example. And of course, yeah, we have this one as well, which was on Sky News, as Alan mentioned. So this is also with that same telescope. And we did see that the, uh, the fish had uh, as part of the heart nebula um, with a short focal length telescope. All right, so now the fun part. Um, pictures are nice, but uh, it's, uh, there are challenges to, to get these pictures. So you kind of have to be prepared. Uh, but that's you know that's, that's half the fun. So the the main the main um, issue you could say or concern or challenge is that these targets are very very dim. It's not like uh, regular photography where you can just point your camera at something and take a picture. A picture is usually hours and hours and hours of of uh, light and photons coming in. Um, and because these pictures the, these targets are very dim, uh, light pollution becomes a problem. Uh, the light pollution, actually, the background light of the sky competes with the signal of the actual target, making it very difficult to pick, um, to pick that up or to uh, image uh, that target. So we need hours and hours of, 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 in, of exposure, and this is called integration. So what we do is, instead of taking a single 10-hour uh, uh, exposure as, as they used to back in the day with film, now it's all uh, you know, digital and on computers. And so we take five, 10, you know, 15 minute short uh, chunks, and then we superimpose them or, or, uh, with our computers into a single image. Uh, another challenge is, uh, as I mentioned, is the tracking of the sky, which, you know, in, so as we know, the earth is not flat, it's a rotating globe. <laughs> uh, and so everything moves in the sky. So in, and it, it sounds easy in, in theory, okay, we'll, we'll just track the sky. But in practice, to get everything on a microscopic scale to match your uh, rotation with the rotation of the earth with the same speed and the same axis isn't that simple in, in practice. So tracking of the sky becomes uh, another challenge which uh, we have to master. And then for those who are using uh, reflectors, or mirror type telescopes, we do have the issue of optical alignment, which is called collimation. And with some telescopes, it's easier than others. And some telescopes, it's just a nightmare. Uh, I've been through a state, uh, I've had, you know, first had experience with telescopes that are very difficult to collimate. And it just gives you deformed stars, um, no matter what you do. And I'll show you some, uh, just basically what it looks like. And then after you get everything fixed and everything works well, and you've, you've done your homework, then you have to deal with the atmosphere. So there's atmospheric seeing, which is something that uh, we as amateurs can't really do much about. It's only the planetary imagers that can kind of cheat uh, the atmosphere as we, as we saw uh, with the examples of, of say Jupiter. That's a different kind of imaging. That's a different technique called lucky imaging, which is totally different. It doesn't really apply to us uh, deep sky. Uh, imagers. So I'll just go through um, these, you know, very quickly, just to get an idea. This is uh, what this is how light pollution. This is a simple way of, of looking at light pollution. It's called the Bortle scale. Basically, it's a it's a scale from one to nine. One being perfectly dark, nine being downtown Vancouver, looking up at the sky, you don't see anything. Fortunately, I think uh, here in West Vancouver, we're probably at five or six, I think SFU is probably between six to seven. It depends how many lights are on at uh, in the adjacent building, <laughs> but uh, it does become a problem. So you can see it makes a very big difference uh, in the night sky. And I actually tested this. Uh, this is a test image of the same target, the Whirlpool galaxy. So the one on the left is uh, a target um, from backyard here, uh, probably Portal 5.5, which isn't great to be honest, but you know, you can actually get, you can get some kind of data. And the one on the right is Portal 9. So basically it just washes out all the faint detail. You can't see um, half of the details, which is a shame. Most of the people, uh, most of the people living in cities never get to experience the night sky because of light pollution. Uh, Next, let's look at signal to noise ratio. So 
This is why, uh, this is an example, this is actually my own data uh, of why we need so much uh, light gathered and so much in, uh, integration. The one on the left is uh, three times five uh, minutes, which is 15 minutes of data gathered of light basically absorbed by the sensor. And you can see it's very grainy and very noisy and very, you know, there's, some, you can't really see a lot of detail. So this is what, this is what's known as a noisy image with low signal to noise ratio. Same target from the same night. This was 62 of those short exposures and that's five hours. And now you can see it really cleans up and you, uh, you see a lot of the background uh, detail and, uh, and it's a lot cleaner basically. Uh, there's a lot of math that goes into uh, you know, the reason of how this works and there's a lot of uh, physics that goes into it. And I want to get into that uh, right now, but I did uh, just to show you uh, a visual um, representation of what happens is that same data, if we take a look, this blue line is the signal to noise ratio. And obviously you want this line as high as possible. The more signal you have, it, it'll drown out the noise. So it, it, the, the image looks cleaner and sharper. And uh, basically, yeah, that's, that's what we're striving for. So the, the axis down here is the hours versus the vertical axis is the num number of uh, frames. Sorry, uh, is the uh, signal to noise ratio. So you can see initially when you start within the first hour, you have vastly increased the signal to noise ratio and you keep going and it, and it keeps getting better and better. But at some point it becomes, the difference becomes very minimal, unfortunately. So it's not like we take, you know, 10 hours of, of data and, and it's a lot better than, for example, six hours. The last four hours, it just goes up very, very slowly. And this is why it's very time consuming. Unfortunately, uh, deep uh, sky imaging uh, requires a lot of patience because it builds up quickly, but then after a while, um, the improvement in your uh, the quality of the image is very, very slow. So it's not a lot of return for a lot more time. And this is the reason why we want uh, bigger telescopes, we want better cameras, we want darker sites is when we increase those parameters, uh, those factors, we can uh, increase this amount of signal at a faster, faster pace. This is another example of uh, poor tracking versus good tracking. So uh, this is this is one of the mounts that I that I've used that I'm using. This is a good mount. Uh, there are other versions. There are other different technologies that uh, there's. For example, the one at SFU is a totally different uh, tech way of doing it. So these are mechanical with gears. Those are mostly uh, you could say uh, electronic with magnetic fields. Um, you need very very high uh, precision tracking. It's on a microscopic scale, actually. Um, it's very hard to, to um, get past the concept. But um, yeah, we're dealing with arc seconds, which I won't, again, I won't bore you with the math, but just know that it's, you know, less than humans hair worth of error that this, uh, this mount can, can be off. And a very small uh, error in your tracking will give you this image on the left. So this is what it means. This is what poor tracking does to your image. It's blurred, basically. It looks like it's moving, which in, it kind of is with respect to your uh, sensor. The one on the right is when you get your tracking right, it's very nice and sharp and, and crisp. So yeah, the bigger the telescope, the, the smaller the tolerances get. All right, so uh, very quickly, because this, this can be, you know, there are books and books on, on collimation of different telescopes and different techniques. Um, when we're dealing, so these, these telescopes, like the one at SFU or the one that I'm using, they usually have a number of, of uh, mirrors. Actually, the one at the, the larger one uh, uh, at, the, at SFU has three mirrors. This one has two. Um, basically, there's a big primary mirror that uh, uh, gathers the light and then it shoots it to the secondary mirror, which then shoots it to the sensor in the back. What's important is, the angle, these two, between these two, they have to be facing each other uh, perfectly within, again, less than human's hair uh, of, of error. They have to be centered with respect to each other optically. They have to be, the distance between them is very, uh, very um, important. And everything is on a very small optical scale. Actually, the distance between them, this is 
something that you know a lot of people don't think don't realize is the distance between them changes with respect to the temperature so as the, the night uh, progresses it gets cooler and the material of this telescope contracts which is the nature of, of, of materials and so this shifts your focus point that's why with a drop of temperature you do need to um, change check your focus and, and refocus really and that's why a lot of these telescopes are made with uh, low expansion uh, materials like carbon fiber the optics are not really glass uh, the high-end telescopes are few silica and quartz and and even higher uh, spec materials like uh, ceramics so there you have to watch out you know for a lot of lot of tiny details uh, when you're getting into this kind of high resolution imaging and as i said you get everything done everything looks good you know you fixed everything uh everything is from on, from your side you know you've, you've done your job and then you have to deal with the atmosphere so uh this is i don't know if it's very clear on on uh on your screens, but the one on the left, you get a sharper image with smaller stars, uh, fine detail is, is visible. And on the right, this is poor, this is what poor seeing does. Now seeing, uh, it basically blurs the image. And this is because of turbulence uh, in the atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere. And lucky uh, for us, you know, being so uh, far north, uh, we have to deal with the jet stream as well, which I feel uh, in winter, it's usually worse. Um, and there are nights where you have very bad, a few nights ago it was clear, I was happy, and I tried, and, and the seeing was just miserable. Uh, here's a fun fact, when you go outside, you look at the stars, and they're twinkly, and they're beautiful, that's usually a very bad sign. If you see twinkling stars, <laughs> it's bad. Uh, that's because the atmosphere is just, you know, is basically dancing all over the place, and you get these, uh, that, that's what causes stars to twinkle, and astronomers just hate uh, that kind of scene. Professional observatories, they do have technologies that can uh, uh, kind of counteract uh, uh, this effect known as um, adaptive optics. Uh, sorry, yeah, adaptive optics, but uh, multi-million dollar setups, which is, it's not really uh, accessible to amateurs like us. So basically there are some nights you're lucky, some nights you're not. It depends a lot on your, um, location however i must say that uh, uh past few nights um mostly because uh this new telescope that i got it does have much sharper optics and i did get uh i did measure the the seeing and it was at a very pretty good so uh, better than i expected let's say a uh, number uh close to two arc seconds i actually got a few sub twos of 1.8 1.9 arc seconds of, of uh, uh, of seeing, which is good. I mean, you know, there are places like Hawaii and Chile, which are um, much better for seeing, but it's, Vancouver wasn't, it wasn't as bad as I expected a few nights ago. Let's see what happens um, further on in the season. Yeah, so uh, I'll just give you a quick tour of these, of these telescopes, uh, how they work and what they are. So this is, uh, uh, this is the current one, uh, plane wave, um, it's called the CDK-14, which is a 14-inch uh, telescope. Um, it's about 2,500 millimeters of focal length. Uh, these are, again, these are yeah, carbon fiber bodies with um, low expansion optics. Uh, these are easy to live with. Um, collimation is relatively um, easier than other uh, telescopes, like the RC telescopes. Uh, but what's nice is now with modern telescopes, amateurs like us, we can fully uh, automate uh, the entire system. So we have uh, focus control. We have uh, here we have a uh, this is what's known as a rotating focuser. There's one on the, the, the one at SFU as well. So what this can do is this can turn the camera for you. This can focus the, the focal plane in and out. It can actually move a human's a hair's worth, the thickness of a human hair in 750 individual steps so that's how fine the resolution is on these things for focusing uh, and then you know we have a, we can control everything else we can even control the temperature of the optics the airflow inside the telescope then this is all this is all needed to make sure that uh, the telescope especially here in vancouver i usually it's 90 plus uh, percent humidity 
And if you go outside, everything is wet. Obviously, you don't want your telescope mirror to be wet. So you do need to manage uh, the airflow and the temperature. Uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of things we can do uh, to improve our uh, our imaging sessions. But luckily nowadays, you know, you can, most of the stuff you can just buy off the shelf. They're all compatible. You put them together. Okay, it's not that simple, but usually <laughs> it works. Uh, and um, this is something very nice. I uh, software that I'm have been using for the past few years. I actually wrote a review on this one. It's called Nina. Uh, it's uh, open source, community based uh, software, completely free. They update this once every two or three nights, and it's just become so powerful recently that uh, uh, it's amazing what it can do. And there, you know, there are additional plugins and, and add-ons you can get on uh, get you know on a weekly basis and there's, there's just so many things it can do for you um it can monitor you know the your stars and your tracking and your seeing this is what you know a lot of softwares can do that but this one you can actually fully automate and you can tell it you know uh open my dome for me salute to so-and-so target take two hours with so-and-so filter uh, refocus if you notice a temperature drop and that's of half a degree change filters for me and then refocus again and then uh, go to another target. It, you can program it and go to bed basically. And you can tell it if you sense any rain or anything, you know, shut my dome for me. So um, it's really put, uh, you know, made amateurs, um, it's given an open different, you know, another door to say or, or for, for amateurs to get into the whole um, fully automated remote um, imaging. Even even at home, you don't you know you don't need to be sitting outside by your telescope, and all this can be done uh, remotely or semi-remotely. Um, yeah, so the camera that I'm using is uh, uh, these are relatively new. Uh, they used to be CCD back in the day, but now CMOS is really uh, I feel it's really taken over. Uh, this is the KH the KH five six hundred, which uses a uh, Sony monochrome chip actually. Uh, 62 million pixels, so they're small pixels, but there are a lot of them. Uh, pretty big uh, sensor size. They were smaller in the past, but now this is a 43 millimeter full frame sensor, which is a decent size. What's nice about these cameras uh, are, is the quantum efficiency. Now that is the light that the telescope captures falls onto the sensor and that in the past, half of that light was, wasn't detected. It was, imagine it was blind in one eye. Uh, it was about 50 to 60% of the light would be converted from photons to digital signal, uh, to electrons basically, and then you know, to digital signal. Um, these new ones, you know, they, they peak at 90%. So they're really getting up there, very high, very high efficiency. Uh, and, um, there are also very, very low read noise uh, compared to the, um, the other, the older CCDs. And the noise is basically the grainy uh, dots that you see. These are basically more sensitive and cleaner uh, data producing chips. And uh, they can go 35 degrees below ambient. So when it's zero degrees outside, uh, they can go to minus 35 degrees C, which is not even necessary nowadays. They're just uh, very nice and clean. So. This has opened up a lot of doors again for, for amateurs. Five years ago, this kind of these kind of numbers were impossible. So that's also very nice. Yeah, and then a lot of people, a lot of uh, beginners are like, oh, you know, how do you get uh, color images? Uh, I don't know, do we have a lot of uh, imagers here in the crowd or some are imagers and some are visual? Yeah, Howard, I guess, yeah. I, I believe you're an imager yourself. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I'll just give you guys a, just a brief, I won't get into too much detail. I wanna, some people may not be very interested, but uh, it is a little interesting to me at least. Uh, so we use color filters to get um, uh, color images from a black and white or monochrome sensor. Now color is kind of a strange topic. Uh, color doesn't really exist. We just see, we just call, the wavelengths of light from 400 to 500, our eyes detect this as blue. It's a bit random. There is no such, there's no, you know, breaking point between the colors. There, no, it's, 
there, there are a lot more colors, you know, between uh, after red, which is infrared, and there are a lot of colors or light before blue, you know, which is UV and much less. So our eyes just happen to pick, you know, to describe 400 to 500 is blue, 500 to 600 nanometers, that's the wavelength of the, of, of the light as green, and then 600 to 700 as, as red. So what we do is we, we, we isolate these, these gaps of, you could say, of the, uh, of the width uh, of the, the spectrum and we, with different filters, and then we image with the red, with the green and the blue separately. And then with the software, we can combine all these and get a composite image. And that's what's known as RGB or broadband imaging. Broadband is because it's broad. It's from 400 to 700, so it's 300 nanometers wide. And uh, I can show you some examples uh, of, of broadband uh, imaging. This is a filter wheel, by the way. These are motorized. And these filters go over uh, the, the sensor. And we tell the software to uh, you know, turn this filter wheel and switch to different color filters. So this is a broadband image of a galaxy, the M51. Uh, this was taken, um, again, from our backyard. So this was only five, five and a half hours of, of data. That's how sensitive these cameras are. Uh, this is 31 million light years from Earth. So, you know, to be able to capture something like this uh, as an amateur, it's, uh, it is uh, rewarding. And you can actually see they're tiny. If you look over here, I don't know if you guys can see it on your screen. When you look at these pictures, if you look in the background, you'll see a bunch of tiny galaxies that are even further out. And um, yeah, so I'll, we can go through a bunch of these um, broadband images. Here's one of M51. This was taken with a smaller 10-inch um, telescope, an RC telescope. Uh, the smaller the scope, usually it does require more light. It's not um, um, as uh, big of a light bucket. It's not just the size. There's the focal ratio as well. But this one, for example, was 28 hours of, of uh, data capture um, of M81 boat galaxy. So this was, yeah, with the RC telescope. These galaxies are huge. I won't get into the, you know, what, what galaxies are, but, but uh, yeah, they are very huge. There are quite a few of them in the sky. Here's another one, again, broadband example, uh, pinwheel galaxy. This was, for example, with a, this was the 12 inch telescope, and this is 13 hours of, uh, of integration. You can see quite a lot of uh, detail and they're nice clean images. And we have to keep in mind, this is from semi-light polluted uh, skies. We actually have two street lights right next to our house. Uh, there's nothing much I can do about them. But um, I would like to maybe see if I can take this telescope uh, to a dark site if we have one of these star parties in, the, in this summer. And uh, in theory, being at a much darker site, uh, you should be able to gather you know, the same amount of detail uh, you know, in half the time, hopefully. Let's see if we can make that happen. Uh, another one, the Firework uh, Galaxy, seven and a half hours of data. So if, if we look here, for example, I have, I have uh, three hours for the actual red, green, and blue. So that's an hour each, which is not much, to be honest. And then I use a clear filter, uh, which is here is about four hours of data. And so this is actually called LRGB imaging, which is a different, uh, uh, slightly different technique. It's more effective, I feel, for galaxies. And I'm actually now using for my uh, L uh, filter a, uh, a chroma low glow, which does help with uh, some of the light pollution. It can filter out, so that's helpful. So next up, uh, let's have a look at narrowband imaging. Uh, this is also exciting. It's a different kind of imaging for different targets. So if you remember that we looked at broadband, which was uh, from 400 to 700. So it was a 300 nanometer gap that we used uh, that we could capture. When we're dealing with broadband, we pick a specific frequency uh, here, for example, Hydrogen or hydrogen alpha is at 656 nanometers. And the filters that, for example, I use are three nanometers thick, uh, is, is the bandwidth of, of these, uh, let's say, uh, these filters. So that's 1% of the light we use. Everything else we block out. So we block out everything else, including light pollution, 
And these things are fantastic at, you know, at shooting, you can get from almost from downtown, you can do deep sky imaging to an extent. Uh, they're much less um, affected by light pollution. But you have to keep in mind that uh, we are taking a very small portion of light. So your exposure times are much, much longer. You need a lot more light because you're rejecting most of the light. These filters, when you look at them, they actually look like a mirror or opaque piece of glass. You can't really see through them. Uh, uh, they reject a lot of the light. So what we do is typically we pick three of these uh, of the gases that are abundant uh, in the universe. So it's hydrogen, oxygen. These are ionized uh, gases, uh, O3 and, and sulfur. And these are different frequencies, different wavelengths. And think of it like as a, let's say a neon light. You know how the neon lights, they inject them with different gases and then they excite them. And then you get these you know, different colors. The concept is similar. So these different gases in space uh, are excited usually by uh, bright young stars that emit UV radiation. And that uh, excites these different gases at different uh, wavelengths. So we can pick these out and we can filter them. And then we can image uh, what's known as a yeah, narrow band imaging. That, this is what the Hubble uh, telescope also, if you look at the NASA images, they do uh, that as well with their known as the Hubble palette, which they use these three uh, same filters. So here's a, an interesting example. This is the same, uh, the heart of the heart nebula. So here we have whatever white you see here, whatever light you see here is hydrogen alpha. Now I'll go to the next slide, which is oxygen. And I, I hope you can see on your screens, the difference or the contrast between hydrogen and then oxygen. So we have hydrogen, and oxygen. I hope it's clear there on, on the screen. I don't know what you guys see if you see that resolution. Uh, and then from oxygen to sulfur. So quite a big difference. So hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. So when we have these three, then we can uh, make a, a false color uh, composite. Uh, there are different ways you can put these together, but uh, a popular way of doing it is, uh, based, is the Hubble palette and that's putting these three together, which is, gives us the, the same image that we saw. So those three combined, we get uh, the SHO palette. And then uh, that is done, not by uh, the flickering of my finger here on the screen. It's actually a lot of work, data processing. Um, there are a few different uh, softwares out there. PixInsight is what I'm using. Uh, and this part is very laborious for me, at least. It's hours and hours of fiddling with the data, filtering out the data. Usually, not all your uh, all your data ends up being uh, good quality data. Sometimes it's very it's heartbreaking where you have to get rid of half of it because the quality wasn't good, or the tracking wasn't good, the seeing wasn't good. Uh, and those who ask for imagers can maybe they can uh, they can feel this pain more, but. Uh, this is something that you do have to learn and you do have to master. Uh, data processing, there's actually, there's probably more you can gain with good uh, data processing than with good hardware. So if you buy a very big expensive telescope and you don't know how to uh, process that data, you won't get good results, you know. And yeah, so, but luckily um, there are a lot of YouTube videos, there are a lot of forums, there are a lot of help files. Uh, on how to use, uh, for example, it doesn't have to be PixInsight. There are other softwares out there like APP, for example, but it's just, you, you have to put in the time. It takes a fair amount of time to, to master. Uh, I've been, I think I've been using PixInsight for, I don't know, three, four years. I feel like I know maybe 15% of it. There's so many, there's so many functions, so many, uh, you know, so many features. It's, it's very powerful. Yeah, so I'll just go through quickly through uh, uh, narrowband examples. So Crescent Nebula, this is actually, this is a bicolor uh, image. So bicolor is, it's only using two filters. It uses hydrogen for red and hydrogen alpha actually is red. It's a deep red. And then it uses for green and blue, uh, uh, the oxygen, uh, the O3 filter. And the O3 filter, when you look through it, is actually this color, is this, it's this bluish teal greenish color. And that's the color of, 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 uh, uh, of oxygen, of O3 ionized oxygen. Uh, this is kind of what it would look like in nature as well. So this is close, this is a close representation. It's not that false uh, color, but 
yeah, so this is uh, what uh, bicolor imaging uh, looks like. This is only four, four and a half, five hours of data. Pretty impressed at how fast the signal of uh, these cameras and telescopes pick up. Uh, another example, this is three filters, the um, elephant's trunk, it's called, this is a close-up of the elephant's trunk. Uh, some nice colors, a lot of detail here. You can see, uh, yeah, this is 11 hours of data of integration. Bubble Nebula, this was a high, relatively high resolution image. Um, I actually do have a closer, a close up. This is decent for a backyard uh, picture. You do see a lot of detail. This was, I think, uh, 0 0.5 or six arc seconds per pixel. So this is pretty good resolution out of a 12 inch telescope. I'm hoping to try this now with the sharper 14 inch and the new camera and seeing what uh, difference this makes. Um, another popular one is the Pac-Man Nebula. This is 14 and a half hours of data. And Pac-Man actually has a lot going on. If you zoom in, you see some nice high resolution uh, details here in the core. And these little globules you see, these are actually huge. These are probably, they'll, you know, they'll coalesce and they'll be their own stars and then solar systems and planets. And you, know, you never know, you could have aliens and uh, or different uh, beings living on these little specks here. So these little globules uh, turn into their own uh, you know, planets and suns. So the scale of these things are huge. And yes, oh, the final, uh, this one is uh, uh, the famous Eagle Nebula that Hubble took. Uh, Pillars of Creation here, close up. This was again with a 14 inch telescope from a uh, backyard. Just amazing what you can do, uh, you know, stuff off the internet. <laughs> so you see a good, decent amount of detail here. This is with hydrogen alpha and it's very good at cutting out light pollution. This was from a Bortnell 8 uh, location. Yeah, you get a lot of detail uh, here as well. And uh, also I would like to now, once this is all done, I'd like to, sh the most important accessory uh, that you need you know, for, for very good quality imaging and to be a professional astrophotographer is a very nice caffeine delivery system. So <laughs> just be mindful that you will lose a lot of sleep because everything happens at night. You have to be out at night tinkering and, you know, collimating and, uh, stuff doesn't work so you do lo lose a lot of sleep unfortunately with this uh, hobby so uh, yes you do need good caffeine delivery <laughs> and uh, that's it folks some links and questions and contacts and uh, social media but yeah so i hope i didn't bore you guys too much oh not at all rude yeah <laughs> i'm happy i was muted because i was gasping wow so many oh your voice isn't isn't it's a bit low it's not very clear but we can kind of make out i guess oh, let me try again yeah yeah let me try again yeah, yeah don't right. worry. i was just happy i was muted because uh, i was gasping wow all the time so okay that's good that's good stuff. what I'm an glad. amazing uh, presentation um do are there any questions uh you can use the chat if you like or you can unmute and ask your questions if, if everybody's shy, we can turn off the recording for this portion too. Uh, Sometimes uh, works. I have, I a, have question. a question, Rose. That was really yeah. a wonderful talk. Uh, those pictures are really impressive. Uh, I'm particularly impressed by the number of hours you manage per object from our dismal climate here. I yeah. mean, <laughs> so if you're doing 10, 12, 14 hours per object, I mean, how many, how many things can you do in a month or a year. I mean, it can't be all that many because we're so No, many. unfortunately not many. I um, actually, I wanted to, I didn't really touch on this uh, in, in the presentation. The observatory I feel is the biggest investment, the best investment that you can have because right now, as we speak, you know, I was, I was telling Alan, tonight might be clear. So I have the fans on the dome and it's powered up, ready to go. Um, any moment I feel, you know, any, any, I have like two, three hour window domes, if the telescope's cool, it's ready to go, it's outside. But, uh, what I've noticed is what I'm doing now is, uh, actually, uh, I didn't really maybe discuss this so much, uh, as uh, we get bigger telescopes, usually the resolution is meant to get bigger, uh, better, uh, like the one, for example, the SFU, but. In reality, especially here in Vancouver, we are limited to how much resolution we can get out of these telescopes. 
So we are seeing limited and all the telescopes, no matter how big they are, they'll all see roughly, you know, at the two arc second resolution. So what I've been working on last year, uh, the past maybe one or two years is using that, um, you can actually, you can convert resolution into speed. So, so especially with these new cameras, uh, by down sampling and because of their low read noise, uh, what you can do is you can, you can basically set your, your limit to how much resolution the sky has and not use any more of that resolution. And the remainder of that resolution, you can kind of trade that in, think of it as, as points uh, for speed. So that's what I've done right now is um, I've gone from, let's say a 10 to 12 to a 14. I've kept my resolution at the same uh, level but there are different ways. One, one, way, one way of doing it is, is this thing here. Actually, I don't know if you guys can see it. So this is a, a uh, can you see that? Uh, field flattener. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is, this is a, 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 a plain wave a focal reducer. Hmm. Um, these are, it's a pricey piece of glass, but I've, uh, so what I'm doing now is I'm reducing up the focal ratio, which is one easy way of doing it. Uh, from f7 to, for example, f4.5, 4.7. Mm. And then that's still not enough. That's still, even with the, with the high, uh, with the reduced focal length, uh, the resolution is still too high for these small pixels. So now, and after that, you, uh, you have to do it digitally by downsampling. So I downsampled everything to between 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 arc seconds per pixel. And that doubles the signal to noise ratio compared to, uh, uh, what it's at. And obviously these new cameras, basically I looked for something with the highest quantum efficiency. So these things all add up, for example, uh, you get the, the biggest telescope you can get, the fastest focal ratio, the most efficient uh, um, camera and the, the tightest narrow band uh, uh, to block everything else out. Um, these are um, filters. And yeah, and the rest of it, you actually have to make up for with integration unfortunately but that's why i'm i'm hoping maybe this summer i can go somewhere to a darker site uh yeah there there aren't that many clear nights <laughs> that's true hi ruth my name is kai uh i'm actually new to this group uh first time meeting Welcome. i've been i've been looking at these pictures and i'm in in awe of them uh, i'm just starting out i haven't even fired up my scope yet I hasn't seen first light Okay. But I just will have some questions around the technology because I'm yeah. really into the technology. Yeah. I, I see a lot of people using software, running it on their Mac or on their PC or a small brick computer. I decided yeah. to go with a, the ASI Air, which is all in one yeah. uh, unit. Because I was yeah. trying to keep it simple because I'm scared of all this complexity. And yeah. it was a part of that reason I went that route. It was the same with the camera. I went with a color CMOS camera versus yeah. a monochrome and filters because I was worried about the complexity of filters and all that stuff. So one question I have is, you know, uh, where's the trade-off? And then the, another trade-off is autofocuser. I keep hearing of electronic autofocus. I haven't gotten it yet. I, I may be just overboard in technology and afraid to start, but you know, some, some advice for the beginner. Okay, actually you've done it the right way. Uh, you should start off uh, with a color camera because monochrome is a lot of work. Uh, it's three times, the, three or four times the amount of work. They are, technically you can get more, uh, they are more sensitive and you can get more resolution out of them, but the difference isn't that great, especially if you're doing, uh, if you're looking at broadband uh, targets like galaxies, you won't see a very huge difference. Uh, as a beginner, I would say simplify your life. And that's why I started off with uh, definitely go for a refractor. I don't know what kind of telescope you got. Um, I have a I William was... Optic uh, 73 millimeter. Yeah, so that, that's, that's a small refractor with a field flattener. On Excellent. It. Yeah. The biggest mistake everybody makes is they're like, okay, this, this three inch refractor costs as much as an eight inch uh, uh, SCT, Schmidt Newtonian, and that's got four times the focal length. Okay, I'll just go get the big one. But it doesn't work that way. Uh, what you've done is right. A refractor is much easier to uh, live with. So number one, you've, you've uh, eliminated collimation. Like going for a color camera is the right step because you've eliminated uh, another component, which is the filter wheel and filters and uh, processing with mono. Uh, the ASI Air is a very good uh, way to get started. Uh, what it 
it doesn't teach you uh, the proper way of doing things manually because it kind of, it's a bit of a point and shoot thing, but to get started, that's what you want. You want something because I'm sure you're going to have so many things to get over. Uh, oh yes. Just yeah. even polar alignment, back focus yeah. and all, yeah. uh, all that stuff I keep reading about and scares me away. It is, it is scary. <laughs> to be honest, it's scary. You're right. Uh, for autofocus, I would say uh, if you're using the ASI, I would use, I would get the, uh, the ZW EAF, which is their electronic focuser. It's only $300. And that'll that'll simplify your life because you you're more you're most likely you won't be able to uh, find you know find focus with uh, your hands. And the thing is, you focus especially with these uh, metal tube refractors. Twenty minutes down the line, thirty minutes down the line, your focus has changed. So you won't be able to notice that. That's why autofocus is the way forward. And the ASI does a very good job. But basically, you just click autofocus and it will focus for you. Now you have to use a focus mask and do it by hand. So I think you've done it uh, the right way. And I, I hope uh, to see uh, your images in the near future. <laughs> I, I appreciate your advice. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay, we have a, we have a in the chat uh, question. Whoops, oh, it's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful pre from uh, Devin Kettle to everyone. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you for thank you for long exposures and wide fields. How do you deal with things like satellite trails or aircraft? Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> um, when you take a, a larger number, uh, one way of doing it is taking short exposures. So um, I. The shorter the exposures, then you can sift through these exposures. And if they're, let's say, two, three minutes long each, um, you can, it's fine. You can basically delete a few of the ones with very bright trails. If you have a lot of exposures, let's say you have 100 exposures, um, some software, like for example, PixInsight, can actually, uh, with the rejection algorithms, it can reject those. Uh, those bright um, streaks because they weren't there in let's say in 99 of your frames and they happen to be in one of the frames and the software is smart enough to know okay that's not supposed to be there and it get rid uh, gets rid of it but your best bet is to shorten your uh, exposures to have more subs to get rid of um, uh, these outlying um, uh, examples that's that's what I would do Excellent. So what about um, when, when you're dealing with shorter exposures or longer exposures, uh, how do you choose um, your exposure details as far as yeah. ISO settings or your, or, yeah. um, and and how long do you, do, you, do you just stick with 30 or 45 seconds no matter what? Um, no, uh, that's a good question. Actually, that's not a very simple, uh, there's not a very a simple straightforward uh, uh, answer. It depends on your optical setup. So if you are using a fast telescope, let's say an F4 versus an F8, it makes a difference. If you are, it depends on your camera. If you have a camera with low uh, read noise or high read noise, and it also depends on your full well capacity, and that's how much uh, charge each pixel can hold mm -hmm. before it's saturated. And when it's saturated, then it's blind. It can't see anymore. Um, one, so the upper limit you set by uh, taking an exposure, let's say you take a five minute exposure, usually 30 to 40 seconds is too short, I think. You take it, let's say you take a five minute exposure and then you see uh, your stars and if it's, let's say a galaxy, the core of the galaxy, if it's bloated or if it's clipped or if it's oversaturated, you know, okay, this exposure is too long. And then you bring it down to four minutes to three minutes. Uh, you don't want too short of an exposure also, because if you take 500 one second exposures, uh, you will, your read noise will build up. And with these CMOS cameras, uh, it, it actually is very complicated because now CMOS cameras, you can play with the game. And as you play with the game, you play with your read noise and your full well capacity. Actually, these cameras that I'm using, they get even more complicated. They're different read out modes. So gain, at a certain, uh, a certain gain with different modes, you have different full well capacities and full. Anyway, I, I don't wanna overcomplicate mm -hmm. it. Basically, if you take an exposure that's too long and your stars are bloated or oversaturated and you know what that looks like, right? They're just big fight, uh, white stars and you see your histogram and it's no longer is kind of in the middle. 
you kind of want to keep your exposure shorter to have your histogram towards the one third from the left. You know, when you get a, mm -hmm. a, your, your histogram under here, if it's a DSLR or even if it's yeah. a regular camera. Um, for the short side of things, um, start off with a longer one and keep get going shorter and shorter until you can uh, basically eliminate these uh, very bright stars. It is, a, it is a science getting into it. There are Excel sheets, there are formulas of how to get your optimum exposure. Uh, it's not something I can tell you, you know, what the, the, the numbers. Your site actually also makes a difference. If you're at a, from the inner city, you would have to take shorter exposures. If it's in a darker site, you have to take uh, longer exposures. But the, the number one thing to watch out for is your stars are not, and the core of your target isn't burnt out. And also that your mount can handle it. If you take a 500 second exposure and your polar alignment isn't good enough or your mount isn't good enough and you see your stars are beginning to trail, that means even if your camera can handle it now, your mount can't handle it. So there are different limits, uh, different things that limit you to take exposures. But usually, I don't know, what kind of camera are you using? I'm using a mixture. I'm just moving from terrestrial photography to astro. Mm -hmm. So I'm using at right now just Canon lenses at the moment. Uh, okay. The Rokinon 135 as well. Okay. Uh, but I've also got um, a Canon, uh, I guess a, a, an APS-C camera and a full frame. And also I've got a one shot color. So it really depends on, I'm, I'm yeah. having all kinds of niggly hardware issues at the moment. Yeah. But just, so I, I, well, yeah, yeah. I guess my follow-up question was, or my other question was going to be, um, because I've got this right now, this hodgepodge of different things as I'm moving from, as I'm just getting into it, at what point should it, should I, would it be better off sticking, picking one particular technology and sticking with it? So I'll go out and like I've got an eye on a particular refractor, get that camera and stick with it and work with it and do nothing else but. I would say yes. Uh, it is um, even even if you focus on one. Uh, kind of imaging and, and one kind of setup, it's still so many things to work on. So you're definitely, it's not a good idea to have four different cameras and five different telescopes, especially to begin with. Mm -hmm. even, even myself, I've kind of, I had a whole bunch of things, you know, I was doing planetary, I was doing deep sky. I am now focusing and, you know, you kind of have to specialize on one setup and kind of uh, exhaust that uh, to its maximum potential. I would say given today's, um, CMOS cameras, they are far better than I think what DSLRs can do because uh, DSLRs are just difficult to live with. Uh, they're not, you know, they have filters that are not really meant for nighttime uh, imaging. Mm -hmm. uh, their sensors are not cooled. Actually, the longer that you use a DSLR, the more it heats up, it physically gets warm and it just gets noisier and noisier and you can't really make repeatable uh, mm -hmm. calibration files. So now you have these cooled CMOS cameras for $800, $900. You can even get used ones for, for less, but you get a brand new one. I think they're the, the, the color cameras are now in the $900 range. Mm -hmm. They're smaller chips, but you need a smaller telescope to begin with. Uh, a nice little triplet, uh, three inches enough, four maximum, and uh, one of those cameras, and your your life will be a lot more uh, yeah. rewarding. You're asking yeah, my, right, right now, my, to, I'm, I'm yeah. having such a hard time just physically getting it mounted. Yeah. Because, you know, it's like trying to put a square peg in a round hole. I think, uh, especially nowadays with what's available uh, for such a good, uh, for such, with, with so much ease, best thing is to get specialized, get a small refractor and a small uh, color uh, CMOS camera, and, you know, it'll make it much more enjoyable, mm -hmm. at least. And they cost a lot less than those full-frame Canon uh, DSLRs. Mm -hmm. 